welcome. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, my workshop called Beyond the Framework, um, uh, where we, we, we will be talking about desktop apps, but not focused on one specific framework. We will be taking things beyond the framework. We will be focusing on what, you know, makes a desktop app a desktop app how to build one and what to focus on and not get hung up on the details because at the end of the day a framework is just a tool so this is, it's going to be the agenda for this workshop uh um well at first you know i'm going to tell you a bit about the history of apps and the history of the web, because I feel like that's something that's very much overlooked. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about how you choose a framework, what things to look out for, um, and sort of a few categories that we found helpful when choosing a framework. Um, and then lastly, we're going to talk about, you know, how to think about how apps, how to structure your code, how to work, you know, with uh, desktop apps and a few things that are different, you know, to your traditional website development, maybe, and stuff to look out for. Who am I? You know, who's the who's the guy talking to you? So I am a member of the Tauri Working Group, um, but I'm also a DevRel, DevRel at Crop Nebula. And to explain that a bit more, Tauri, if you're not familiar, familiar, um, it's a framework for building desktop apps using web technology. And we focus very much on small binaries, on secure apps, and on, um, yeah, on what I like to call choice, because Tauri is a compiled framework. Um, that will make a bit more sense later when we jump into the <laughs> exercises. Um, and yeah, but I'm also definitely at Crab Nebula. Crab Nebula is the company, uh, it's a company we founded to really take things further and to help, you know, you potentially companies to take their desktop apps, uh, you know, to the next level. Uh, and we do consulting, we do auditing, and we're also working on tools to improve the desktop app experience using web technology. I also maintain a couple you know, open source libraries and tools and crates uh, in the Vite ecosystem, for example, and then Rust crates, because I, you know, I started with JavaScript. I did that for, for a long time. Uh, but now, since about a year, I picked up Rust. And I, I really like it. <laughs> and so if you are, because, it, you know, that's, if you look on Twitter, that has come up time and time again. Uh, people from the JavaScript community being interested in Rust. Uh, if you are one of them and you want to, you know, want to talk to me about the problems you're facing or you are unsure how to start, um, definitely reach out to me on, you know, uh, Twitter or Mastodon. Uh, the handles are on screen right now. Um, cool. That's about me. Uh, next, let's prepare for the exercises. So we have a couple exercises coming up to, you know, let you play around with a bit of uh, like a few apps and to check out the things that I'm going to be talking out for yourself. Um, instructions are on this website. So I'm going to put the same link in chat. You don't need to scan the QR code if you don't want to. Um, or type up, uh, type the URL yourself. Um, there you will see a link to, uh, there's, there will be a card that says uh, workshop, uh, and then there will be a link to the assets, which they will, they are a Git repository on GitHub. Um, you can check that out. You should make sure if you want to follow along using the Tauri framework, uh, that you also have the prerequisites, um, but the link to that should also be in the repo. Everything everything is self-contained in that one repo. So uh, we have a choice if you, depending on, you know, what language you're looking for, if you're sort of wanting to try a bit of Rust, 
then we have Tauri. If you are, you know, if you just want to stay in JavaScript land, we you can also follow along using Electron. And then lastly, we have PWA as a choice as well, progressive web app. I, I feel like that should be, you know, should be good for everyone. Um, and yeah, those are branches in that repo. So you can check you can um, check out the branch you want. Uh, the branches are branches are named named accordingly. Um, and if you're just here, you know, if you're just here to to vibe and just want to read along, you can of course also do that. Um, and yeah, cool. If you oh, that's one thing more to mention. Um, I, you know, we all you know here to have a good time. If you have any questions, um, don't hesitate. Don't uh, you know keep them to the end. Don't forget about them. Uh, feel free to ask them in chat at any time, and I will make sure to answer them if I can. Um, cool. So history lesson. <laughs> Great. You know. Uh, learning something. Uh, so the web and apps, because this is something that I feel like is uh, often overlooked and something where um, that people don't really know about. And that's very interesting to me because often you hear people saying, oh, you know, you build an app using web technology, but that's not native. That's not a real app. That's not, uh, you know, not proper. Uh, and I dug a bit deeper and, you know, the web and apps are very much intertwined. So starting out with uh, in 1945, the sort of the uh, academic work that led up to you know computers that uh, are used by what what was then called knowledge workers, what we would now call you know just regular people <laughs> um, using computers. Um, the Vannevar Bush, I don't really know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but you know, uh, he came up with a system called Memex, which was meant to augment, augment the sort of the human mind using computers. And this was very much sort of theoretical. Um, and then later on, just, you know, because in the, uh, in the, 40s, the computer technology really, really wasn't advanced enough to sort of put his ideas into practice. But in the 1960s, Douglas Engelbart, uh, you may have heard the name, also one of the pioneers of computing technology, he worked on the online system, which was very much inspired by, um, by what Vannevar Bush proposed. And something that would then, and that's sort of the interesting part, which would then later go on to influence a lot of the hypertext uh, and i they were also talking about you know links and interlinking documents and and things like that and out of this sort of research um in the 1960s a lot of the people that were uh, people that worked on that project with douglas engelbart then went on to go work at xerox park where they were working on you know one of the first uh, personal computers with a GUI operating system. And again, a lot of the inspiration, you know, in the back of their minds came from this, you know, knowledge worker, interlinked documents, augmenting the human mind. And this, you know, to give you sort of a bit of perspective, this was very early in, in time, you can see near 1970s to 1980s. Uh, a lot of this was then still stuck, you know, in, in research and in, in um, academic circles. But then, you know, 1985 rolled around, Windows 1.0 was released. So, you know, widespread, if you will, in the, in the world of then computers, adoption of um, graphical operating systems. And then in 1987, this is sort of a often talked about very important concept or very important product, not, you know, not used much, but as an influence, uh, the Apple HyperCard system, which was one of the earliest that, that I know about that I could find earliest um, systems where users could sort of program their own computer in a graphical way and sort of have this very easy to use programmable interface to their computers. 
using cards and stacks of cards, uh, very sort of a very physical metaphor, but again, very much influenced by the work, you know, the theoretical work on hypertext and on, you know, augmenting the human mind. Um, but not, you know, not in any way related to anything that we would consider the web. So this was like purely like um, building sort of small apps on your computer. So, you know, the, the original low code, no code uh, app, if you will. Uh, and then in 1989, this is, you know, where we start to pick up web steam now, finally. Um, Tim Berners-Lee invents the World Wide Web. Um, and again, not the same group of people, but again, influenced by, you know, hypertext and interlinked documents and this whole notion of taking a computer to augment the human mind. And now, now we're sort of progressing into web page territory, right? Up until this point, everything was, was apps and what you would consider native. Um, and now we suddenly have websites. Uh, of course, you know, very basic at first. And then 1993, Mosaic released. And with that sort of progression started what, well, actually, you know, the, all of the modern browsers we have to this, to this day. And this just, you know, a very brief excerpt because, you know, I don't want to bore you, but um, just to goes, goes to show that um, right from the beginning of, you know, the web and, and apps, this has been very much interlinked. So the notion of, a, of hypertext and hyperlinks and interlinked documents has been with computers, not just with the web, but with computers from the very beginning. And very much all of the UI and GUI operating systems and GUI concepts that have come out out, out of uh, com computer science in that very early time, uh, they're very much inspired by, you know, hypertext, which is crazy if you think about it, because the World Wide Web as a concept, you know, the, the web that we work in to this day um, came much later than that. Um, and sort of to, I, I feel like this arc you know, it, it has a very nice arc to it because if we sort of jump ahead to the modern day now, um, you know, the the announcement, recent history uh, by Apple that, you know, the iPhone would not be running native apps. It would be running web apps. Um, crazy if you think about it, but just goes to show that the line and, you know, if you if you are on, on, on Twitter or, you know, Reddit or Hacker News, like, the line that people like to draw on the sand that says this is this app is native and this app is not native that line is very blurry if it exists at all um and this line just gets even blurrier as time goes on because you know you may have not heard about the name but google in 2019 announced what they called project fugu which is just sort of a tracking effort for a lot of the web APIs that we've recently got. You know, things like web MIDI or interfacing with USB devices, things like that, all of these sort of APIs that really blur the line again, you know, between what a website can do and what an app can do. These, you know, the project really started to sort of blur the line again. If we had sort of had in the early 2000s, if we had sort of a very, very clear separation between, you know, what websites are and what you know native apps are then now again just as in the early days this line is very much blurring right now um, so there are a lot of technologies to do this right um, and you know one question that we always get is so many options right w what do I do how do I choose one and um, I have a few you know I have a few select choices. There are many, many more choices um, out there. And, you know, what I always tell people and what we always tell people uh, is there, you know, a couple sort of categories that you should look out for. And 
most of these should, you know, if you are a web developer, sound familiar, right? Because at the end of the day, a lot of the categories you choose a web front end framework by are very similar to what you choose, uh, what you would choose a desktop app framework by. For example, the first category I, I always tell people is core features, right? Like what are the features of the framework? What sort of, what is supported? And then that, for example, includes like, hey, I, you know, I'm very experienced in this front end framework or my team, you know, uses React, my team uses Svelte. Does this framework that I'm about to pick up, does it support my front end framework? Or what are the web APIs support, right? Like my app, for example, uses notifications. Is that supported? Can I use it? Things like that, right? Um, that's sort of a very, very basic category. The next one, and I put this at this, you know, um, I put this at the very sort of front of this list because I feel like it's m way more important than people give it credit for is sort of the developer experience, right? Because we all know web development today is very easy and we have all grown used to web development being very easy, right? I can spin up a Vite server. It starts up very fast. Oh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, you know, you can start up a local development server. It starts up very fast, very nice to use. We have a great ecosystem of, of you know, libraries on NPM. And um, ideally, the desktop, you know, framework that you choose should reflect that, right? The desktop framework, the whole experience should be as easy as, you know, working with a regular website. And um, of course, that, you know, isn't necessarily sort of always the case because you're sort of adding a layer of complexity on top of it um, with that desktop app framework. But ideally, you know, the de developer experience should be as easy as developing websites. And that includes, you know, as I mentioned, local development. How fast is it to start up? Is it, you know, feeling nice in my machine? Is it integrating with all the tools that are already used? But then also um, the recording should be enabled, I hope. Um, OK, cool. Sorry, <laughs> interrupted. Um, but then as I as I you know mentioned uh, with NPM, does it you know does it support my libraries? You know, no website, no app is developed completely from scratch. So is my library supported? Can I pull it in very easily? Is uh, is that a good experience? And then lastly, the one thing that desktop apps and websites, you know, where's the very big difference is packaging and distribution. Right, um, because with yeah, um, because with um, websites, what you do is you find yourself a web server, a web hoster. Oftentimes nowadays, right, you can just connect your GitHub repo to that service, and it will deploy for you. Um, but with desktop apps, you need to go through that step of packaging up your app bundling it, putting it up into the app store, code signing it. And that's, uh, you know, in, we will get to that in more detail, but that's all part of the developer experience. And to me, that is very important. Similarly, similarly, very important um, learning resources, right? Chances are that you're not born an expert in any of these frameworks, right? So what's the way to learn it? You know, is there a good documentation? Are, you know, are there many videos out of uh, out there on, on, on YouTube or any other platforms to learn this if you're sort of more a visual person? Are there blog posts? You know, is there a forum you can ask questions or even uh, formal training in any way, shape or form? Um, and then one thing that I also feel, you know, as a non-native uh, English speaker that gets over, often overlooked is, you know, are all of these 
resources also available in my language? You know, is it something that I can very easily pick up, especially if I'm learning a new thing and don't want to deal with the overhead of then parsing it in English? You know, learning resources, very important as a category. And then lastly, this is very you know, specific to desktop apps. You're likely building desktop apps because you want to go beyond what the web can offer, right? You want to have tighter integration with the operating system. You want to have access to the resources, the full resources that the computer offers you without going sort of through the indirection of the sandbox that the browser builds, right? And then it becomes very, very important, you know, to look at, okay, what operating system integrations do I need? You know, are they supported by my framework? Things like creating windows, very basic, you know, most of them can do that. Um, and then, but, but like, you know, also more complicated things like notifications or file system. Um, and then also, of course, which operating system are, uh, systems are important, uh, sorry, are supported. Um, I, you know, what's the support on Linux, for example, because um, as much as I love Linux, you know, every distribution almost, almost counts as its own mini operating system. So what is the operating system support? You know, is that operating system that I need is the one that I care about, is that supported? Or the one that my users care about, right? So those are the four categories that I have, you know, or we have identified as being very, very important when you consider which framework to choose, uh, what to look at. And um, there are, of course, you know, more, and then it gets, gets more nuanced, but sort of as a quick introduction, those are the most important uh, ones to look out for. And with that, the boring bit out of the way for now. Um, let's jump into some code, shall we? So the way this works, and let me exit. <laughs> yeah, so I hope you can see this. What I have up running right now are three apps that all say, hello, JS Nation. And those are the three apps, you know, the three ways that um, you, well, not the only three way, ways, of course, but, you know, the three kinds of examples that I included, the three technologies. Um, and I will, you know, give you a quick rundown of each one of these Hello World, Hello World um, apps to kind of show you and also talk about, you know, what's different, what's the same to give you an idea, because most of them very different. You know, spoiler alert, this, these are very, very, very similar. Did I say different? Uh, as I, I'm, then I misspoke, kind of. <laughs> In my head, I, I, uh, I thought I said different, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> they are very similar. Um, cool. So let me open up my VS Code. Um, oh, no, before I do that, um, I will bring up the website. So if you click the link uh, that's in chat, this will bring you to this website. Uh, and you can also win an X-Wing. This is uh, also for the proper JS Nation conference. But if you, you know, want to get in early, <laughs> feel free. Um, but what we're looking for is this uh, is this sort of box and click on workshop assets. This brings you to this repository right here. And again, as I said, three branches, Tari, Electron, PWA, um, and we will go through them one by one, starting with PWA. So if you want to follow along, clone the repository. Um, and install the dependencies. You will need Node.js for this. Um, I, I hope you have it installed. If not, 
uh, we can we can also send a link in chat or you Google for Node.js. Um, let me bring up VS Code. Ta-da! <laughs> nice, cool. Here we are. So the way uh, I have this repository structured is that we have this folder with checkpoints in it. And each checkpoint sort of represents a point in time for our app, right? So as we go through this workshop, you know, I will call out, um, okay, or I will tell you we're now at checkpoint one, checkpoint two, checkpoint three, and you can sort of jump ahead if you want. And later, if you sort of want to go back, you can uh, sort of time travel. And you can use these checkpoints as sort of jump, jumping off uh, points for your own exploration and your own. Um, that will sort of be important later. Um, so cool. Let's start with the PWA Hello World, shall we? And uh, because it's really, it's the simplest. And that is because progressive web apps are just websites, right? Websites that the browser lets you install. And as any website, it's an HTML file. Not quite. <laughs> There's also a manifest.json file. And this manifest.json file sort of describes your app. Um, you can, you know, give it a name, give it a short name, uh, and a set of few other things that then will be reflected, you know, in this app. For example, I said I said a theme color here, and and so it sort of took the theme color as sort of the the title bar color. Um, but the one we really care about is this main index.html file. And you can see, very simple, we have sort of a, a style sheet included at the beginning to make things look good. Um, you could, of course, also have this as a separate file. I chose to include it, so we have sort of a neat standalone uh, HTML file. And then we just have our HTML. Hello, JS Nation, right? Um, the one thing that you sort of will need for a progressive web app to work is what's called a service worker. If you're not familiar with that, uh, a service worker is sort of a separate JavaScript script that will run in the background of your browser. And that is responsible for essentially making sure your app is available offline, right? It can do a few other things as well. But this service worker, that's what sort of powers your app behind the scenes. And it can it can do a whole bunch more than just sort of cache your assets and make them available offline. Um, it can also, you know, do background um, background sync things. Like, for example, you can set it to once every two hours sort of fetch new data from a server or something like that. And this, you know, script tag you see right here, this is all the code that is required to load the service worker. So we read it from a file and then we register it. And that takes care of that. And the, the service worker itself is also very simple. This will not sort of change uh, at all. We will not touch this again. Um, and this one will. Uh, just, you know, cache all of our web assets on sort of the first load, if, if it's not already cached. And um, that is, you know, one of the things that is different, that makes it different to just a traditional website is that desktop apps, you know, are usually working offline. So what a user expects from a desktop app is I can just open it. You know, if I'm me as a German, uh, Germany famously not very, you know, good with mobile uh, cell service and mobile internet. So if I'm out somewhere in rural Germany, you know, and uh, I want, I expect my app to start just as fast and to work just as well uh, as when I'm home. And so a service worker is very essential for that. But that is about it. So. 
what you can do to, to run this yourself um, is I included as a development dependency, I included uh, HTTP server and you can run that using uh, the command uh, that's here in the readme. Um, this, you know, being checkpoint one, uh, we run it using this pnpm command. I myself, I prefer pnpm as a package manager. This repo works with npm as well as, as with uh, yarn. So whatever your preference, you know, in the package manager department is, should work as well. And we just, you know, uh, click on start and then we open this link and you know this opens just as any old uh, website with the important difference that um okay wait let me uninstall this again uninstall yep oh uh, it's up again so a PWA is just a website, right? Like, you know, uh, any old website with the important difference that the service worker and the web, sort of this manifest.json file that we have set up, make it so that here in Chrome, for example, it will prompt me or it will, you know, allow me to install this website as an app. And this is really cool because users that will sort of discover your thing through the web will see this and you know will notice oh you know this is also available as app as an app you know version and can then just click install ba boom it's now an app that works offline of course you know the <laughs> the offline part i cannot demonstrate to you right now because then you will you would not be seeing me <laughs> but um this would then you know is now sort of available offline and works as a standalone app cool um let's jump to the electron example because the electron example is also very similar so if you are following along using electron you know, navigate to the checkpoints and then the first folder. And you will see, again, we have an index.html file, right? And this one is even simpler. This is just the style sheet and, you know, the HTML that says, hello, JS nation. And Electron has a very similar sort of thing to a service worker, which is in Electron land called the main thread. And as opposed to sort of the service worker and the web world where service worker, that is optional, right? You can opt into your service worker and sort of the way this works is your website will be loaded first. Your website will start the service worker and then things work offline. In Electron land, this is exactly opposite, right? So you have the main thread that gets started first and the main thread really like it, it's in control of your app, right? The main thread that is your app. And the main thread can then create a window with your HTML in it. So it's sort of the other way around. Um, and this main thread is, you know, running this main.javascript file, main.js file. and as you can see, sort of what this file does is we wait until the app is ready, right? Let me bump up the font size for you some. Is this good? I hope. I hope you can read it. If not, let me know. Um, so what we do is we wait until the app is ready. And then we create a window using this function right here. Uh, and this is some macOS specific code that basically replicates this behavior on macOS where once you close a window and the app doesn't immediately sort of exit as in Windows, but it stays around. And then once you click the icon again, it will sort of bring up a window again. This is, these, you know, lines right here are very macOS specific. Um, 
just so you, so you know. Um, the meaty part of this file is the create window function. And this will create a new browser window, you know, with a predetermined width and height. And then we instruct the main window to load our index.html file. So as I said, you know, this works a bit differently, sort of the, the, the exact way, uh, the exact other way where our main sort of thread is loading the HTML and not the HTML loading the service worker, quote unquote, main thread. Um, and yeah, if you can again run this using the start command. So let me bring up this terminal some more. Um, if you run start in this folder or using this filter syntax, oh, opened on the wrong monitor, but here we are. Um, it opened, you know, a native app again saying hello JSON engine. And this app as opposed to, and this is sort of a difference, right? This is a difference to what we've seen previously. This app, could, you could then sort of package up and distribute as any app, right? The, the problem with PWAs, or it's not, you know, it's not a problem, it's a difference. The difference with PWAs is that you have to always discover them through your browser. Whereas with Electron, you can, you know, distribute them as standalone binaries that work regardless of, you know, any browser or anything like that. Um, let's close this. Uh, and, you know, if I bring this up again, as you could, as you could see, if I close this window, you know, the app doesn't go away. Um, but it stays sort of in the background. That's exactly what this code did. Uh, let's quit this for good and move on to the Tauri version of this, right? So, oh, am I? No. Ah, here we are. Um, Tauri version of this. Oh, do I have uncommitted changes? Oh, okay, okay. I <laughs> I just changed the change point name, uh, the app name. Sorry. Um, no, cool. So if you are following along using Tauri, then you navigate to the first folder, and you will notice this looks somewhat different, right? This where's my where's my HTML file? And the HTML file is in the source folder. Um, again, you know, style sheet, HTML. We know this, right? This is the same. So one thing we already learned, all of these use essentially the same sort of web layer, right? There's no difference in the web layer as we expect, right? Because this is about building apps using web technology. The web technology part of this does not change. This is very much, you know, the same. But the difference with Tauri apps is the source Tauri folder. And this is where sort of I need to I need to explain a bit because I, I don't you know I don't assume that you are familiar with Tauri at all. Um, the way Tauri works, as opposed to say the way Electron works, where Electron has a you know comes distributed as a single binary, right? That's sort of the Electron binary, and you tell the Electron binary to run your JavaScript. Uh, very similar to how you tell Node.js to run your JavaScript, right? Um, but the way Tauri works is Tauri is just a Rust crate. And it's a Rust crate that you can pull into your sort of Rust project, and you can then sort of build your own uh, desktop app using that, right? You can tell the desktop app to load a file. You can do whatever but the important bit is that you are still in control of the the rust binary right since the rust binary is compiled on your machine you can really like pick and choose what parts of sort of the framework you want what parts you need and then you can also bring in optional parts to expand the functionality and that all happens sort of at compile time so you, like really you only get what you need um, 
because it is sort of compiled, right? It's not just a static binary, but it's sort of compiled into a binary. Um, and then that gives you a few advantages. And that's sort of why we started the project in the first place. The advantages being that, you know, since you only get what you really need, Tauri binaries are much, 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 much smaller um, and also more secure because we sort of don't read any JavaScript files from disk or anything like that. The JavaScript files are sort of baked into your app at compile time. That's what we can you know, do since it's a compiled uh, since it's a compiled thing. Um, and, you know, what I just opened, the main.rs file, this is essentially our equivalent of the main.js file, right? So in, in Electron, you had uh, the main.js file, which was creating your main thread and then opening a new window, loading your HTML, doing all that. And this is essentially the same thing. You can see we have a main function here because Rust you know, uh, needs that to run. And the first thing we do is we create our Tauri app. And then here on this line, we run our app, right? And that's sort of it. Um, another very important file in a Tauri project is this tauri.conf.json file. And this is again, actually very similar to what we saw with um, PWAs, right? Where um, we had the manifest.json file where we described our app, where we said sort of a name and a few other sort of things. And the tauri.conf.json file really is the same thing, just with more options and geared sort of towards Tauri, right? So right here, again, we can give a sort of special name to our app. We can set the version of it. And we can set a whole bunch more options. Um, this is, you know, goes again to the point that I was making where you are probably looking for a desktop app framework because you want to go beyond what the browser can give you, right? So this is very similar to your manifest or JSON file from PWAs, but it's going beyond what the browser can give you. So, um, and this file sort of will be read at compile time and Tauri will make, you know, the right choices for you in the final binary based on the options you set here. So that's one thing where the Tauri working group has spent a lot of time. Um, we ha uh, have sort of, Seeing that, you know, learning Rust is a challenge. Learning Rust is not easy. And, you know, if you have a great idea for an app, you probably want to get this app, you know, done and out the door as fast as possible. You don't really have time to learn Rust, you know? So we try to make sure, and I would sort of, you know, believe that we achieved this very well now, uh, is that you don't need any Rust to build Tauri apps. And this was sort of one of the, the, um, the main points we had in mind is that you should be able to configure your app using this JSON file and then do anything else using JavaScript if you don't want to touch any Rust. And that's sort of, I feel like that's very important. Um, so yeah, with that, again, we can start using pnpm we can start our tauri app and you know it what it just did it compiled sort of our app and now it ran our app and ta-da boom we have our app and it's running and you know again similar to electron but different to pwas so differences and similarities right a Tauri app will produce one single binary at the end that you can just distribute independently of any browsers or anything like that. So let's close this down and head back to our slides. Um, cool. So 
any questions so far? Did you get stuck on the Hello World examples? Did anything, you know, fail to start, fail to compile? Or are we good? Uh, do you feel good to move on? Maybe, you know, we can get a bit of feedback in chat. So I don't, you're not feeling left behind. Okay, crickets in chat, all good. Very cool, nice. So I will, um, I will be mostly focusing on the electron um, sort of variant of this, right? I will also show a bit of a of Tauri, um, but since I, you know, I I kind of assume that you are sort of the the electron variant of this is the easiest to grok. I will sort of use that to show off uh, the exercises and to work on them. Um, I think that makes sense. So, uh, cool. You know, now we have a hello world up running. But now what, right? So this is one thing that I see a lot and have felt a lot uh, when I started my journey is that a lot of the frameworks and a lot of the documentation and a lot of tutorials always focus on, hey, this is how you get up. Uh, this is how you get started. This is how you set up, you know, this is how you set up your app. This is a Hello World app. And then you follow that tutorial, right? You follow that guide. and you're done, you have a running Hello World app, but then, you know, the, the host is always like, cool, now you are equipped to build apps, have fun, go out there and, and do stuff. But, I, you know, I always sat there and was like, yeah, but, you know, I d still don't really know how to approach this, right? Like, building an app is a lot more complicated like building a real app is a lot more complicated than building a hello world app so like you know where do i get started what do i do what are sort of things to look out for how do i think about apps and so i couldn't come up with a better name for this than common issues but this section is you know and this is sort of what the ex exercises are going to focus on it's going to teach you a bit about how uh, how to think about apps, right? How to think about apps in a way that you sort of see where things are, again, you know, where things are different to web development that you might be uh, used to, or, you know, are the same to the web development that, that you might be used to. So you can sort of take your existing skills your existing knowledge and extrapolate um, extrapolate out into desktop app development. Um, the most important thing, and, and I feel like this is sort of the foundation of any, any app development, and it's becoming a lot more important in the web as well. You know, as I said, the browser vendors are constantly sort of increasing the blurriness of the line between what's you know sort of a native app and what's a website but the one you know main thing to think about when you are working on apps is the main thread and the render thread and that is a sort of a model that has been introduced first uh, i believe by chrome and that's multi-threading sort of in your web browser, right? And the idea is that you have one thread that is sort of in control of your app. That's the one that starts the windows. That's the one that does OS interactions. And then that main thread spawns a whole bunch of render threads and, you know, utility threads to actually then draw stuff on screen, right? So in Chromium, or Chrome, um, a render thread would be equivalent to a tab or a window, right? So each website's context would be running in its own render thread. And that has the nice sort of advantage of taking, uh, you know, uh, 
taking advantage of the multi-core machines that we now sort of all use, but also increases sort of the stability of your app, right? So if, you know, one, if one, in the case of Chrome, if one website has a bug, it doesn't take, take down the whole browser with it, but it just takes down that one thread, right? The same thing goes for your desktop app. If one window sort of has an issue or is, ex is uh, experiencing, you know, problems, if it crashes, it doesn't take down the whole app with it. It just takes that one with window with it. And, you know, you can recover and move on and maybe, you know, do some error handling and then present a nice error message to the user or something like that. So the, th the threading model is important for that reason, but the threading model is also important for a couple other reasons. And, you know, we will now see why. And this is where we will jump back into a few exercises. So we are now at checkpoint two. So let's move over to that. Ta-da, close this one, close that one. Um, and now let me, you know, before we jump into the real code, let me tell you what sort of the demo app is doing that I'm, you know, we're working on right now. And we had a cool, nice little Hello World app, but that's not, you know, that's not really doing anything. And that's not sort of, you know, you're, you're not approaching any kind of limitations with that because you're just rendering, uh, rendering an H1, right? So I thought what's sort of a very simple, uh, a very simple thing that, it does a bit more than just hello world, but will still prove a point, will still sort of showcase what I mean. And I kind of figured, okay, we make let's make a simple, let's make a simple app that just calculates Fibonacci numbers, right? So Fibonacci numbers this uh, number series um, where you know each number is sort of dependent on the two numbers that come before it. And that is sort of neat because there's the way to express this using, using recursion, which is not very efficient. <laughs> and that's sort of the point, right? So um, this function right here is sort of the least efficient version to implement Fibonacci, uh, the Fibonacci algorithm. Um, and that is so that I can show you a bit of like a performance problem down the line. And um, you can now, if you sort of, you know, if that, the fact that this is, you know, the most Im, Im unperformant version of this algorithm, if that kind of, you know, triggers you, uh, then <laughs> feel free to, to refactor this. There are a couple uh, variants on this that are more performant. Um, but I wanted to, kind of focus on this app as sort of a simple demo. Um, and so what this app does, you know, I can enter a number and it will give me the first N, you know, depending on the number that I entered, uh, numbers of the Fibonacci sequence. So zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight. And I can, you know, I can bump this up. I can go to 10, I can go to 25. And you can see the numbers get really big, you know, really fast. Um, and there, you know, if you bump up this number really high, you know, let's say 40, you will notice something interesting, right? So I clicked on 40 and now I cannot, okay, this is, this is done. Let's, let's do 50, you know, let's do 50, calculate. And so, you can see now that while this is computing, I cannot interact with the page anymore. I can still sort of move it around, but hovering on this button does nothing. Scrolling still works because that's you know not dependent on any HTML, but I cannot click this input field. I cannot change it. This app for all intents and purposes is, is completely frozen right now. So this is nothing like, there's nothing I can do with this, with this app anymore right now. And that is because right now this calculation is done single threaded, right? So this is a term you're probably familiar with. If not, let me you know quickly explain this. Um, JavaScript, right, by default runs sort of in a single thread. 
which means that there will be only ever one instruction at a time executed, right? There will only be one thing happening at a time. Even though your machine, your computer can, with multiple cores that it has, execute like some code at the same time, right? It can do multiple things at the same time. And what's worse is with this, uh, you know, implementation that we have chosen right here, this will sort of never yield back to the main thread until it's finished. Like it's actually finished, like calculating all the 50 first Fibonacci numbers. And that's kind of bad because in this world where we only have a single thread to do anything, right? This thread is also responsible of, you know, calculating the background color of this button, you know, letting me interact with this input element, sort of rendering these two buttons I just had uh, here previously, where I could sort of incre increment and decrement the number. Um, it's responsible of like making this interactive. All this is now sort of frozen because instead of handling any user input right now, what we are doing is we're calculating like incredibly large numbers and we're doing that very inefficiently uh, in, you know, not in the background, but in the foreground. Instead of handling user input, we're sort of crunching numbers. And that is, you know, uh, sort of leading a bit to a bit of an issue. And you can see, while I still can resize it, I can like not um, do anything else. And it's still going, right? This is like still happening. Um, and sure, you know, Fibonacci numbers and calculating that might be a bit of a, you know, contrived example, might be a bit stupid, you might say. Um, but this could be also like, you know, decoding a video or encoding a video or doing anything that requires sort of heavy processing. And yeah, let me let me close this so it's it actually stops. Um, and that's sort of you know something to look out for. Um, and similarly, you know, um, if we now navigate to the third checkpoint. And we actually also move over to the third checkpoint. What this, you know, third version of the app added is I added a button at the end right here. Um, so I have here in the HTML, I added a new button called a uh, new window button. And that button just, you know, starts up a new window that spins up a new window that uh, renders the same content, right? Just like creating a second window of this app or a third or a fourth. And this, you know, is sort of resembling what you might find in any real world app, right? Because chances are your app is not confined to a single window. And if it is, you might still want to be able to open multiple instances of it, you know, to have, you know, a side-by-side -side view or something. And we will notice something else. And that is, you know, if we calculate the Fibonacci numbers here and we now open a new window, uh, this is not like, this is not synced anymore, right? This is like out of sync now. Uh, this is not reflecting the app state in one window, in this window. I can, if I do, you know, if I calculate 10 here, and even if I, you know, go to view and reload, this is not synced, this is not, carried across windows, which is a shame. You know, in this sort of, again, in this contrived example, um, sorry, in this contrived example, this might seem a bit pointless, but say, you know, again, you're working on an app, which is sort of like a workstation app, right? Then it would be very helpful if you have a settings window, right? And you sort of change some state in that settings window that that is then reflected in the main window, right? That's the whole point of, of settings like that. And um, if I jump back to the slides, this is like the second big thing why you should really think about threads 
like consciously when you're working on your app, right? And um, let me skip these. And that's like uh, what, you know, this, this technical term called separation of concerns comes in, right? And that is, I have all these sort of threats in my system and each threat, you know, should be responsible for a different thing and uh or it should be responsible for its own thing and it should sort of be specialized in doing what it does and if we go back to sort of this drawing right we have the main threat and we have the the render threats and for each render threat like you might have many right so each render thread is essentially a very lightweight one with the main threat as the name sort of suggests being the main one and I really, you know, I really want to hammer this home and we will hammer this home even further with, you know, the exercises now. Um, but the main thread, that's sort of what's in control of your app, right? So the render thread, as the name suggests, is for rendering and receiving user input. That is, you know, I type something in, it draws that to screen. I enter some input and click submit. Uh, it gives me sort of feedback. And then, you know, there's some state in my app, the state gets rendered, and that's sort of the render threads responsibility. But it importantly, it does not own the state, right? The state is owned by the main thread. It's sort of kept in the main thread. It should, anyway, it should be kept in the main thread where it could then, you know, first of all, it's, you know, protected from malicious sort of users interacting with your app, but it's also synchronized between all of the render threads, all of the windows. Um, and, you know, the other point is you already know this, like think about render threads and main threads, not as render and main threads, but think of them as client server, right? Think of them as web pages and your server. The web page does not own the state, right? If I have sort of a server where, where a user can log in, I'm keeping sort of the user, uh, sort of the user details and all of the, the documents they have created or whatever, I'm keeping that on the server, right? The server is the one that owns the state and the client is merely responsible for sort of rendering that to the user, sort of displaying that in a nice way and also sort of receiving user input to then manipulate that state on the server. And this is really how you should think about render versus main thread, right? So your main thread is the one that's responsible for working. Uh, sorry, no, no, no. The main thread is the one that's responsible for the state and for interacting with the operating system, for doing the privileged things. And the render thread is, ren is for rendering. Um, and with that point, let's jump into checkpoint three. And this is where this is where I want you to follow along if you want to. Um, this is sort of the best opportunity for you to really play around now. Um, and what I want you to do, uh, what I want you to do is how can we refactor this code, right? How can we refactor checkpoint three? the app uh, of checkpoint three, how can we refactor it so that um, we get this logic of the main thread, right? How can we make it so that when we click the button, let's go back to checkpoint three, how can we make it so that when we click the button and calculate something that the app does not freeze, right? This is sort of, let's, this is the first problem that we will tackle. Uh, and maybe you can sort of, Think about this for a second for yourself. And then I will also, um, you know, take this app and, you know, show you how, how I did it. And the way how I did it will also be the one that's in checkpoint four. So if you want to sort of, you know, peek ahead or you just want to sort of know how this is going to end up, uh, you can do that. Uh, as well, but I would sort of I would encourage you to take a minute, you know, think about this. How would you 
make it so that this is not happening on the main thread, right? How can we take advantage of the fact that we have multiple threads um, running? How can we use that to our advantage? And I'm gonna I'm gonna pause here for a second. Um, I want to so yeah, do that. You know, have a play around with the code if you want to. Um, and I'm going to open up the Tauri version of this in the meantime. It's a bit easier, in my opinion, to demonstrate. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to show you now, if I click this in the Tauri app, it freezes the same way, you know, I cannot click, I cannot create a new window, I cannot do anything. This is completely frozen. So how can we move this off of the main thread? Close this down. Open this back up. Boom, okay. Cool. Nice, just sort of a quick question. Um, are you fine with me going ahead? I will, you know, I would, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I wanna leave you enough time to sort of play with this uh, on your own pace, but also uh, I would just sort of jump into showing this off now or sort of showing off my solution. If you, if I don't get any sort of cries if no one's crying out for me to stop, then I will show you how I did it. Cool. Yeah, so in the case of um, Tauri, which I feel like in, in Tauri, sort of this whole concept of a main thread and uh, the render thread is um, a lot more pronounced. It's a lot more present. Um, so I'm going to show this off in, in sort of a Tauri app. So, you know, don't fear. This will involve a light bit of rust, <laughs> but not, not, a, not a lot. Don't worry. I will explain. Um, so first things first, right? We have our main and our render thread. So we want to unblock the render thread right so it can continue to process user input and i feel like in in this way right here it's also very easy to sort of um visualize right because we have the index.html file that represents in code right that represents our render thread and then we have the main.rs file which you know in in sort of source code terms represents our main thread and um so what we do essentially right what we do is let's take this function let's take the fibonacci function and let's you know cut it out of our render thread and let's bring it to our main thread and uh you know of course uh, let's get rid of this uh of course um javascript syntax is not valid rust syntax so what we have to do is, you know, the function keyword is different, but then we have to give this a type and we will make this an unsized integer uh, with 64 bytes of precision. So a relatively large integer, right? Because we know that Fibonacci numbers will get really large. And this function takes in a big integer and it returns a big integer, right? And this n syntax to create a big n as in JavaScript, not a thing in Rust. So we get rid of that. We get rid of this. And return statements in Rust can be implicit. So um, if you think about it, this creates a block 
and this creates a block and whatever sort of is the last statement of that block will get returned immediately uh, Im like implicitly so similar like here you know inline documentation for the win ta um you know return at the end will return that value from the function but it since you know this these are the last expressions sorry let me bring this up since uh, since it's the last expression the last expression will be returned even if you omit the return keyword just because uh, sorry just because rust can figure that out for you automatically so to clean this up a bit you know it's optional but let's get rid of the return and boom you know <laughs> we have just taken a javascript function and rewritten it in rust you know yay uh, first first rust rewrite of our career maybe you know I, I don't know if you're not you might be very experienced rust developers in which case you know hello <laughs> um good to have you here um but you know if this is your first time looking at rust code it is this easy right this is all um we just rewrote a javascript function in rust and this would be like a uh, hundred times faster I actually have not measured it. This might be ex exaggerated, you know, but this will be now, you know, magically faster, which is crazy if you think about it. It was really easy, wasn't it? Um, and one thing that we also want to take off our plate is, uh, you know, setting up an array and then, uh, you know, calling this multiple times. Sorry if I'm if I'm jumping ahead. What the way that we did this, by the way, I, I realized I, I jumped. Uh, I jumped ahead a bit. Uh, the way that we did this is that we call the Fibonacci function, you know, for all the sort of elements up until the number we enter, right? So if we want to get the first six elements of the Fibonacci sequence, we call the Fibonacci function six times with, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then whatever sort of the resulting number of the Fibonacci function is, we take that as the text content of uh, a list item we created. We push that into array of now sort of HTML DOM nodes, right? And then finally we, we sort of render them out using replace children. And that will make it, make it so that all of our list items will appear in this HTML, uh, HTML parent node. Sorry, I, uh, I realized I, I jumped ahead. Um, but we also want to get rid of this loop, right? Because also this loop is blocking our uh, render thread, right? This loop is also making it so that we have to call this a whole couple of times. So what would be ideal is like if we could just get back an array of numbers, right? So let's take this out as well. Oh, let's copy it. And we bring this to our main thread. Let's create a new function called calculate because I'm incredibly, you know, uncreative, <laughs> which takes in a function called a uh, sort of a parameter called limit. Again, let's make this a number and returns a vec of numbers. And in Rust land, a vec is just an array in JavaScript, right? So different word for the same thing. And let's refactor this for loop into a Rust for loop. So what this does, you know, if we parse this very verbose syntax, this basically, you know, initializes i to zero. So from zero to whatever the number is that is in limit, we will run this loop. And Rust has a very sort of elegant way of doing this, right? So the way we do it in Rust is we say from zero, to limit and then we go here and say for i in zero to the limit and then we create sort of new curly braces and this now sort of this loop will now do the same thing as down here and we let's comment this out 
we are not rendering HTML directly, right? But what we do is we create a new array. Let's call this out. And uh, if you're sort of a Rust person, you will now hate me for calling it an array. But uh, essentially, you know, we create a new array. And what we do is we push the output of the Fibonacci number. So of i, we push that into the array. And lastly, what we do is we take that array and we return it. Boom, simple as this. Now, Russ, uh, sorry, now Tauri uh, has a sort of very, uh, has a special thing that makes your Rust functions available to the JavaScript front end, right? And what we do to enable that is we add this, sorry, this type, uh, we add this special bit of syntax on top of our Rust function. And this will take care of all the sort of binding magic. This will make it available in the JavaScript front end. And lastly, we just have to tell people, uh, we'll tell people, we have to tell Tauri about the fact that we want to actually, you know, actually, actually expose this to the JavaScript front end. And we do that by adding it to this line here. And with that, we now have our Rust code done. So we can, you know, let's jump back to the JavaScript and actually now make use of the things we just did. So let's comment this out. Oh, sorry. Let's comment this out. And let's use a Tauri feature called invoke. So we now, we expose this, right? to the JavaScript, but now we need some way of calling this from JavaScript, right? And the way this works in Tauri is we import this it's a property on the global object called, oh, sorry, invoke, right? And as the name suggests, invoke allows you to invoke Rust functionality on the main thread or on sort of, you know, on the background threads. Um, so, you, you know, let's do like left hand, can't type and speak. Let's use this, right? So values await uh, is equal to await invoke. And then we have to give the method, uh, the function name that we defined here as the function to invoke. And we give it the limit. Let's bring this back up. We give it the limit as the argument, right? Make this function asynchronous. Boom. This is it. Um, now, lastly, yeah, let's refactor this whole HTML creation uh, code uh, so that we take this array. This is now an array of numbers, right? This is now an array of numbers. Let's take this array of numbers and turn it into an array of DOM nodes. And the way we do that is we map this array, map, oh, sorry. Um, and then we do this, we do this, V to string. See, we replaced, you know, we replaced the JavaScript code to call this now. And lastly, we just return n because JavaScript does not have the nice feature of Rust where we can just um, omit this line. Um, cool. Lastly, render it out. And that's it. This is all the code, you know, required to move this workload off of the render thread and unblock our UI. So let's rerun this. And let's see if I made any glaring mistakes. Does this still work? Boom. Very nice. Uh, and now, you know, let's test this out proper. Let's run this and say 40. And you can see, first of all, this was really fast. Uh, 
uh, actually as fast though so that I cannot really <laughs> that I cannot really showcase this to you um nah. okay maybe can I inspect element sources Yeah, cool. Um, nice. Well, you know, I can still, this is a bit hard to showcase, but I can still interact with this element right here, even though it's sort of, uh, you know, running and crunching a whole bunch of numbers in the background. Uh, and that's really also what Rust is very good at, right? Crunching a lot of numbers. Uh, and so, that's one of the reasons as well why I chose to sort of, you know, demonstrate this with Tauri. But with that, let's head, um, no, let's not head back to the slides. Let's uh, tackle sort of the next thing. And I'm not going to, for <laughs> For this, I'm not gonna, you know, do the whole thing and and code this with you as well. Um, but let me sort of talk to you what I what sort of how we addressed the second issue, right? The second issue was that now we have a cool app. You know, it stays responsive. It's it's making use of the threads we have. It's sort of making use of this main thread versus render thread paradigm. But if I create a new window this is still not synchronized, right? So how do we sort of synchronize our threads? How do we structure our, our app so we get the state out of this thread and into sort of the main thread so it can be synchronized? And in Tauri, that is equally as simple. And let me just jump to uh, number five. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So what we do essentially is remember our Fibonacci function. Yeah. Um, so what we essentially did is we created a struct and the struct is like an object in Rust, right? And this object will hold our array of values. So now we moved the array of values from JavaScript into Rust. So we moved it from the render thread into our main thread, into our Rust thread. Um, and similar, you know, calculate, we had to do a bit more to sort of, uh, you know, lock our access to that sort of object because it's Rust. Don't worry about that. What I want you to take away from this is that we now move this value, like we move this value, we move the state of our app, which this state is very simple, right? This state is just an object, uh, sort of just an array of numbers. We move this array of numbers so it does not live in the render thread anymore. It's, it's you know not living a separate having not having a separate copy of the state in every render thread, but we have one which lives in our main thread. And I can show you what that effect has uh, or what the effect uh, of that is by running checkpoint five. Right, give it a quick second okay now we have a window and let's you know let's do something not as crazy as uh, 67 fibonacci numbers but let's do something like 20 calculate boom real fast but now we open a new window oh see that yeah it got the it got the fibonacci numbers from the main thread and displayed them sort of immediately right and if we now sort of, let's say 10, you know, updated this, this list, and you can see this didn't update, but if we reload, it updates. And that's, you know, because I sort of cheaped out on, on this sort of demo because uh, I didn't want it to get any more complicated than it already is. You could now very easily also add sort of live updates, right? You could emit, uh, emit events from the main thread to the render thread to tell it, hey, you know, the state just updated. Um, but in this case, sort of, we need a, a reload to sort of get that info. Um, but the point is, this state does not live 
so in the render thread anymore, right? This state is taken off of the render thread into a different one, into the main thread that is responsible for managing the state. Um, and there's one, there's one other very good reason you want would want that, and that is security. And this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. This is something that's very important to me. Security in apps is something that's often overlooked. And that's, you know, especially with, with uh, web technology, that's something we are quite used to, right? Like web browsers nowadays are very good at sandboxing our sites. And even if, you know, someone builds a malicious website, chances that that malicious website will like seriously infect my machine and like, you know, wipe all my files, encrypt everything and, you know, uh, blackmail me for it, for it like a small company worth of, of Bitcoins, that's very small. But with desktop apps, right, these frameworks give you a lot of access to the machine because that's what you want, right? You really want to be able to interface with the machine with your desktop app. But with all that added power also comes, of course, added risk, right? If I am I able to exploit your desktop app, I can do a whole much a whole bunch more damage than what I could do with the website. And here it comes, you know, again, the way to think about apps using this main thread and the render thread comes into play again, because the render thread should always be seen as unprivileged, right? This is sort of your first line of defense against any malicious actor. Whereas the render thread, that's sort of where your X are, right? That's sort of your your precious treasure is kept in the main thread and it's protected. Just like with a server and client where you are sort of your important data that's kept on the server, right? You're not sending any secrets to the browser, to the client. Um, and in this setup, I want you to think about this again, you know, like server and clients, the render thread can ask the main thread to perform actions on its behalf, right? Because the render thread often very much sandboxed as well, like a website. Uh, and so whatever the render thread wants to do with the operating system, like reading files, like, like notifications, like screen sharing, like sound, whatever, right? In all of those situations, the render thread has to ask the main thread to do it on sort of the render threads behalf. And we can see this sort of in a <laughs> in a fun little way. I try to like visualize this when I when I tell people about it. And that is using, you know, people, using stigmas in this uh, this case. Uh, because it, you know, it, it's a lot like with you know how you would secure anything in the real world, right? If I have a bank, I'm not allowed to walk straight into the vault and take out the money I want. I have to ask sort of the person at the counter, hey, can you give me, you know, 10 bucks or whatever. Um, and so in this analogy, you know, the render thread might say, hey, you know, main thread, can you open this file for me? And then the, re the main thread can, uh, you know, inspects that request, you know, looks at the render thread, uh, validates the arguments, and then you know, reads the file from the operating system, the operating system then gives the file back and we hand that file back to the, to the front end. And now we can take this file and we can render it out. We can do whatever with it, right? And, um, but what happens if, you know, a malicious user compromises our front end, right? Again, because like layers of security, the render threat is our first line of sort of defense. Uh, and what happens if that first line of defense gets compromised? Well, you know, in the case of a compromised front end, the, the, we are going to request a file. And in this case, you know, maybe a malicious user, a malicious actor wants to read the passwords of a home machine, right? So it, it tells the main thread, hey, you know, can you read this file? And the main thread will inspect that request, will inspect the, the front end and will determine, you know, Hell no, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you out all the passwords of the machine. That's not none of your business, right? That's not what's what your purpose is. If 
the uncompromised front end, for example, is supposed to just render out Fibonacci numbers, right? What business does it have of you know reading the passwords? That does make does not make any sense. So we can see that in this case, you know, in the best case, in the best security case, a compromised front end that request never even touched the operating system, right? In that case, what the main thread would do if it determines that request to not only be sort of invalid but also to be malicious, it could just like it could terminate the render thread, it could delete all the files. It could prompt the user an error and be like, oh, it looks like your you know, app got infected somehow. And that is very important because like as soon, you know, as you get down deeper into the more privileged layers, the more damage a malicious user can do. Uh, right. And so to 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 sort of reiterate that point, the render thread treat it as unprivileged, right? Treat it as malicious. And the main thread is the one that's in sort of in control of the resources that's in control of interacting with the operating system and it should you know uh it should validate and sanitize any requests that come through to it but and that's also very important you know again the theme of differences and but also similarities you already know this right this is the same way that we build server and client application Right, the server should always validate and sanitize any requests. So you already know all of this, and this is the important part. Um, building desktop apps is a lot, a lot, and that's sort of very important to me. It's a lot like building server client apps. You just have to sort of repurpose your knowledge, right, and sort of rethink all those building blocks you have in your head of what a server does and what sort of the website does take these building blocks and you need to sort of shuffle them around a bit and boom, you already know how to build a desktop app. Um, so that's very important for any desktop app. One of, you know, the other things where people will often say, oh, your app, you know, that's not really native. That's not, you know, it's still, you know, it's still a website, yada, 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 is native feeling UI. And that is, you know, calling back to the history lesson we had right at the start of the talk. What, you know, native feeling, what does it even mean? And that's a good question because I don't know. And so, like, no one knows. And that is the important part. Like, this is a sort of, this is a tricky and very difficult area. And, um, that is because you know UI is a lot of like choices, right? And it's different on each operating system. It's different depending on the Linux front end that you use. And there's also no real sort of clear sort of distinction what is a native UI and what is not. For example, and that's sort of like the fun fact I always uh, like to tell people here is that the macOS settings app right? If you are a Mac OS, you are familiar with it. If not, also might be familiar with it. The settings app, a lot of sort of the pages in that app and a lot of the widgets that you see actually are not native. They are just web views. They are just sort of embedded websites. And that's crazy, right? Because like, if I, you know, if I hadn't tell, uh, told you that, you would have never noticed. And that sort of goes back to the history lesson, right? The line is very blurry here. Um, and it's very sort of hard to define what is native and what is not, but you will feel it. And that's sort of why I say it's it's tricky, right? It's difficult sort of, I, I kind of assume you, most of you are developers uh, and sort of, Certainly me as a developer, I like, you know, I like certainty. I like this definitely being the case. I like, I like it when things are clear, but with UI and especially native feeling, you know, whatever it means, things are very much not clear. But one, you know, tip I like to give you, and that's one thing that I would encourage you to really sort of investigate. And I sort of, made one one video on my YouTube channel and I'm playing, uh, uh, planning to make a lot more uh, is to set up virtual virtual machines. Um, virtual machines, you know, super great because you can have 
all of the operating systems that you are interested in on your machine locally, right? Because me, if I wanted to, you know, test my app on Windows, on Linux, couple, you know, distros on Linux, but then also like maybe OpenBSD, I would need to have like this stack, you know, like this big of, an, of a stack of laptops and like, you know, switch between laptops. No one's got time for that, right? So virtual machines, great tool, great, great tool, use them. Uh, that's my sort of big recommendation in this field. Um, I'm gonna skip the example um, <laughs> and take you right to this slide, right? Um, the second tip I have in regards to UI, and I'm looking, you know, at at, ev at everyone uh, here that is, you know, prone to the same sort of web developer disease that, you know, certainly I started out with where I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a web developer. I, so I also know CSS. I can just, you know, I can just design this. I can code it up. I can implement the functionality. I can make this work. I can build a full app myself. But, you know, turns out, a, you know, design, especially UI design, that is, you know, a profession for a reason. You know, people study that for a reason because it's really complicated because it's really hard right and so if you are you know very serious about your app and i probably don't need to tell you that but hire a designer especially if you're sort of trying to nail operating system specific ui and interactions and you want to feel as native as possible hire a designer hire someone who really knows what they are doing uh but again this is an unsolved problem, right? This is something that we as, as an industry don't yet have a silver bullet for. So if you have a great idea of, you know, simplifying that, because whenever, you know, whenever you see something that's an unsolved problem, whenever you see something like that, that is an opportunity, right? This here, like we can improve as an industry, we can build tools that make this easier. And so, you know, if you have an idea, if you have, you know, a thought in mind, if you know sort of of a way that we could simplify the process of building UIs and you want to, you know, do the industry a solid, then, you know, maybe consider building a library. Certainly, you know, tell people about your idea because this, again, is an unsolved problem. This is something where we, as an industry, still have to, you know, improve, which is also very exciting. And lastly, and this is sort of the one other big thing in desktop apps, packaging and distribution, right? What is what is packaging and distribution? Like, what is that? And that packaging and distribution, that's really like where apps are different from websites. Because websites are, you know, deployed over HTTP. They are loaded live, if you will. Whereas, you know, apps, they are sort of, distributed ahead of time in a variety of different sort of packaging formats, right? On like Android, you would sort of use APK if you're familiar with that, you know, on macOS, you would use the .app or uh, .dmg on Windows, it's MSI, things like that. And to prepare your app, you know, that was a website and a binary, uh, to prepare that for distribution in, you know, on your, excuse me, on your website or the app store, that usually requires like a four-step process. And that four-step process consists of building, you know, which is the process of taking your HTML, your JavaScript, your CSS, but in the case of, for example, Tauri, then also your Rust code, compiling all that, you know, transpiling it, run uh, package, like, you know, you're taking that up, creating files out of that, in a format where that is, you know, now executable. It's not source code anymore. It's something you can, you know, you can double click and it will run. And depending on your, you know, framework, that step might be optional. That step might take longer. That step might be non-existent at all. Because with PWAs, for example, there is no building step at all unless you use, you know, a front-end framework that requires a building step like Svelte or, you know, Vue or whatever. But with Tauri, for example, 
you know, again, differences and similarities with Tauri, this is very much pronounced, right? Because the building step, that is where the magic happens. Um, but cool, you know, now you have your executable, what now? Uh, second step, that is packaging. And packaging, very much similar to the previous step of building, but packaging now takes your executable and a whole bunch of metadata and, and stuff like icons, for example, and packages them up in one of many, many possible app formats, right? This is the, the step where out of an EXE on Windows, you create an MSI or on Apple, uh, or sorry, sorry, on Mac OS, you create off, out of an uh, ELF executable, you turn that into an app with an icon. And now sort of this is already feeling much, much more like a real app than just any, you know, regular executable. Very important step. This is also where you said, you know, your description for your app and things like that. Third step, you know, often overlooked, but if you really get down into the weeds of it, this is sort of often the most painful step and that is code signing. And that is, this is required for macOS. So macOS will not ish, there are of course like developer workarounds, but like in the common case will not even install your app if it's not code signed. And required ish for Windows, if you are sort of familiar with this like warning prompt, this app might contain malware because it could not have, uh, could not been, you know, sort of checked and is not from an authenticated developer. This prompt on Windows, that also goes away if you code sign your app. So this, you know, this step is really important if you want to increase the trust with your users, which, you know, for open source apps, not as important. Also, code signing often costs money. So on macOS, you have to sign up for the developer program. Uh, on Windows, you have to sort of buy the certificate. Um, and uh, this is a bit, this step, you know, is a bit annoying. This step is a bit tedious, cumbersome. Um, but it essentially what it does, it sort of, it makes sure that the app users downloading is coming from the developer that they intended, right? So using that, you really prove that you are the one that built this app, that this binary that a user downloads is actually coming from you and not from a malicious party. And so it, it's it's really, uh, you know, it's really important actually. Uh, and now, you know, speaking of coming from you versus someone else, last step, distribution. Now you have your fully, you know, code signed, packaged, built app. How do you take this and get it to your users? Because that's ultimately what counts, right? Getting this out to the world, getting this out the door to people uh, for them to interact, uh, interact to use it. Uh, and for that, you know, again, you can use a lot of uh, different techniques and and you know services. What I use a lot, and what you know most people use, and what I would also recommend to use is GitHub releases. But there's of course like AWS. And all this, like all these previous steps of like building and packaging and code signing, these are uh, you know things that you can then also automate in CI. So you do not have to you know think about them constantly as as an individual developer. And that's sort of the step four of you know CI and distribution and getting your app out there. Also, you know, in your CI step, you would then submit it to Apple app stores uh, or, and, or like Android stores, uh, Windows store, things like that. Cool. You know, so what if we, what if, what if we learned during, our, during the, this workshop so far? And that is, or, you know, what I sort of would want you to take away, especially is very important this client and server architecture, right? This main thread and render thread architecture. This, you already know this, and you can apply this knowledge, especially sort of with focus on, you know, performance and security. You can use this knowledge to build desktop apps, right? Use multi-threading, use this to your advantage. Um, and again, like think about it as if you were building client and server apps. Um, and yeah, again, you already know how to build an operating, uh, how to build a desktop app. 
And um, that to me, that is very exciting and very empowering. You know, the web tech desktop app frameworks, you know, they have really democratized access to building desktop apps. And that's very cool. And um, one other thing sort of, you know, that I <laughs> at this point uh, should mention, what I mentioned right at the beginning of my of my talk, the last you know few steps that I talked about with the bundling uh, and things like that, we sort of um, as the working group of Tauri um, have you know thought about this a lot, and we have spent a lot of time and energy sort of you know trying to make the build process nicer, trying to make the user experience nicer, and you know what's sort of our latest. Uh, what our, our latest effort in this direction is, is actually spinning up a company. And this company, you know, mentioned it right at the beginning, um, you know, the middle sort of category I want you to focus on is distribution. And this is what we're building on right now is making what I just talked about with signing and distribution and building and packaging and CI, making this very easy. Because right at the start, as I mentioned, I truly believe that building desktop apps should be as easy as deploying a website. And we're sort of working on that. We're not there yet. Um, you know, you can follow us if you want to sort of be kept in the loop, but that's sort of where our uh, heart is. And this is where we, you know, we think that improving the experience for desktop apps and apps in general now, um, that's sort of where we spend our time to really make that area really good. And also, you know, if anything that was interesting during the last, what is it now, two hours, uh, you know, if you enjoyed that, if you know, if you got inspired, if you sort of want to build an app as well now, uh, and you want to get help, you know, similar to what I talked about, we also do consulting, we do auditing. So if you or your company is looking to build an app, we can teach you, we can help you, we can make sure your code is good, things like that. And lastly, I should also mention we are hiring. So if you want to work with us on this, you know, on improving apps, bringing cool, nice, performant and small desktop apps to the people, get in touch, you know, click the link, uh, message us on Twitter. Um, and with that, thanks so much. We are, oh yes, and <laughs> um, Lorenz also just mentioned in chat, uh, if you, you know want to enter our giveaway, also do that. We should um, tell more people about it. Cool. Um, well, with that, we, you know, are not quite uh, over the two hour mark, very close to it. Um, and I would say, uh, I, I open this for questions now. So any questions, anything. Also, of course, you can always jump into the Discord server uh, or message me or, you know, mention Crab Nebula on Twitter or anything if you have any questions at a later point in time. If not, then, you know, thanks so much for being here. And I would call this a wrap now. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for attending. Thanks for listening.